All right, welcome once again to the Spring Integrated Design Lab series here. Uh, thanks for coming and thanks to those of you who are online for joining us. Uh, welcome folks from CTA in Montana. I understand that there's a group there watching and also from ZGF, I believe in Portland. Um, tonight's speaker I'm really excited in to introduce. Um, I, uh, but, bef but before we get there, I just want to go through some of the normal uh, introductions. So I'm Kevin Van Inway Mellenberg, director of the lab here, um, University of Idaho, and the, the, the series is always, as always, brought to you by uh, Idaho Power Company, uh, Vista, Northwestern Energy, and Better Bricks, uh, along with our sister universities, Washington State and Montana State. Um, as always, sign in, please, uh, either before or after the lecture. Uh, if you need CEUs uh, and you're in the room, it's real easy. Uh, just sign your name in and you'll be taken care of. If you're online and you need CEUs, um, make sure that you have someone from your firm logging in, which if you're seeing me, that should have happened. And uh, we will send out a test and you'll have a few days to get it back to us for online CEUs. Um, a couple of quick event announcements like usual. Uh, we have a guest speaker for BSUG this week, Friday, uh, so that is two days from now, apologize about that. Uh, tomorrow, thank you. Yeah, even faster. <laughs> uh, tomorrow at noon, right, Ari? Yep. Okay, very good. Joe Huang is coming in from uh, the Berkeley area. And we also have Thomas Auer coming in from Transolar at Stuttgart. He managed to get out of the European volcanic cloud and made it to Seattle. Uh, so he's in, I believe he made it to Seattle today and he'll be coming here next week Tuesday. Correct me if I'm wrong, anyone? No, it is Tuesday. Very good. So uh, if you haven't registered, you're too late, but you can still come and show up at the door. Uh, so it's $20 at the door. It's at the Doubletree. Uh, and we are doing evaluation forms, and I will try to get those out near the end. Uh, it's a simple one-page form so that we can tell Lou what a great guy he is. And uh, we have one more speaker uh, next week, Thursday, Heather Burpee coming in from University of Washington uh, High Performance Hospitals. And that will round out our series. So did I miss anything? Okay, very good. I will briefly introduce Lou. Uh, Lou Capozzi is the, what do, what do we call it? What's your formal title, Lou? Facilities manager. Facilities manager. He's the guy that makes the building work. Uh, the Genzyme Center is a really cool building. I'm very excited that uh, Lou is going to come here and talk about all the nuts and bolts and what, what worked real easily and what was a challenge and those kind of things in making a high performance building operate in a high performance fashion. Uh, we're going to get it kicked off with a quick DVD here, but before we jump into that, I'll let Lou uh, give a little better introduction for himself. Hi. Well, I'm glad you guys can all make it. I'm from the Boston area, so if you have a problem with understanding me, please speak up. The, uh, I'm going to show a video right now of the building when we first opened up, and it's October 03. And I think this was done to maybe a year after. And there's a few dignitaries in there. Uh, Robert Kennedy's in there. Ed Kennedy. Ted Kennedy, I'm sorry. <laughs> Robney and our CEO. Okay. You want to show it? Right. It's about six minutes and 34 seconds. Thank you. 
this should be as friendly, as human as possible. And he talked to us about the building from the inside out, not from the outside in. He gave us ideas about how innovation and technology truly can deliver a green building. Green is the color of Genzyme. Green makes a lot of sense. Green buildings, environmentally friendly buildings, is a form of life sciences. This is New England Business Day on NECM. Genzyme officially opened its new global headquarters in Cambridge, Massachusetts this afternoon. Senator Edward Kennedy and Governor Mitt Romney of Massachusetts both attended the ribbon cutting. This is not the time to step back. This is not a time to say, we've done enough. We have too many possibilities of breakthroughs in these life sciences. And Genzyme is going to be out there uh, leading uh, the way. This is News Center 5. Coverage you can count on. And a vision of the future inside the office of a local company that's all about the environment. Step inside the atrium of the new Genzyme Center in Cambridge, and you're greeted by cutting-edge design. Yeah. But it's what you don't see as easily that makes this structure stand out. Caught in just the right light, Genzyme's new Cambridge headquarters literally sparkles. It's almost like still being outside when you come into the atrium and you just have this sense of you're not inside a building. From running water to exotic trees, the designers turned the building inside out. There are basically 18 indoor gardens instead of putting landscaper on the outside, we pushed the perimeter of the building to the perimeter of the site and brought that environment inside in the atrium. For their new headquarters, Genzyme, a biotechnology company, wanted cutting edge, recycled innovation. There's a good percentage of recycled content in almost all the materials used in the building. The framework has aluminum um, extrusions which have recycled content, uh, drywall, uh, ceiling panels, um, wood materials. Um, have recycled content. The centerpiece of the building is the light that filters down, but for more on that, we have to go all the way up. These special mirrors called heliostats are mounted on the roof, and they're programmed to track the path of the sun throughout the day. They track the sun and reflect the light to another system of mirrors mounted on the other side of the roof. And then those reflect the light constantly down into the atrium throughout the day. Like diamonds in the sky, the atrium's giant prism mobile catches that light, splashing it onto the walls and floors below. In turn, the building becomes a stage for a troop of dancing rainbows, competing with natural light from the exterior. The way that the offices are designed is offices on the exterior of the building have glass walls, and then the light enhancement system, which includes blinds that reflect light into the interior space, um, the, the glass walls just permit the light to just permeate right into the heart of the building. There are enviable Boston views looking outward. And looking inward, the building opens into a theme of glass transparency. People are using less voicemail, less email. They're connecting with one another face to face. It's, it's just a very, very unique environment to work in. Encasing the building is a loggia, an outer shell that holds heat in the winter and cool air in the summer. It even allows access to fresh air. From top to bottom, this building is all about conservation, saving on energy, electricity, and water. At Genzyme, the building of tomorrow is here today, made from the stuff of yesterday. I express appreciation for the responsibility and commitment which said that's a brownfield site next to a power plant, but we're gonna build a world-class, best-in-the-world green building there. Think of that. That's commitment. That's responsibility. Those are the kinds of attributes that I think make Genzyme a great corporation. This is the right spot for us. And Brownfield, if you think of it, is an extraordinary opportunity to do something right. Because when you build a plant like Alston, you build an engineering marvel. When you build an office, you have to think about how to make that an interesting experience, an important experience, a learning experience, an innovative experience. And all of this, of course, happens through people. It's all a matter of people. So the building has to work for the employees. It has to be uh, inviting for the employees to work together with full regard of their privacy as well. 
because indeed if we are successful together we will make a difference we will make a difference to all our lives to all of the lives of people not here in this space today uh, and that is both a responsibility and a tremendous exciting thing uh, to work on together so i appreciate you all being here i am grateful for all of you who have been so tremendously have helpful to getting us to where we are today thank you so much What do you think? Nice building? The atrium. The building stands 300 and uh, the square footage in the building is 352,000 square feet. 70,000 is the atrium itself. So up and down, we'll get you through this. A little bit about Genzyme itself. The 12,000 employees, we help patients over 100 countries, 17 manufacturing plants, nine genetic testing labs, 19 major marketing products. 2009, we had a revenue of 4.5 billion, 85 locations, 40 countries, and the gentleman you saw, Henry Tamir, is our CEO. He, uh, he is, it was his idea to push to be green. When we were first building the building, we were in design stages in 1999 and 2000. We had no idea that we would go a green building. The USGBC came to us and asked us if we would consider going to have green points. And that, it actually moved on. Our focus is we develop breaking through therapies. Is my glass. We're committed to making significant improvements in patient lives, and we are patient-focused. Some of our major products, I don't know if you're into the biotech world, it's uh, very, you know, the drugs themselves are designed just for very rare diseases, and there are very few limited throughout the world. Genzyme uh, has the product so far. I see we're, we're getting a little, uh, People are starting to, other companies are starting to come up with the, a genetic type of uh, product. For transparency, we'll move on. The concept of Genzyme Center is to reflect the Genzyme core values, bring the inside out, the environmentally responsible and energy efficient. The basic building, the um, architect were Banish, Banish and Partner. It was their first building in Germany. From, they lived in Germany, they came to America. It was the first building in America. There was a few issues that we had to deal with, with them coming, being in Germany. Some of the architects were in California and some were in New York. So it was a lot of times, nine o'clock at night having meetings. He was a, um, a great architect. At the beginning when they had the proposals to come in and Henry Timmy had to pick these architect firms, Five of them come in and they all had these great designs. And there's a booklet in the back there, you could look at it, and it's all he had was a little sketch on a piece of paper and he gave it to Henry. And Henry he said, all right, we'll take you. Because he wanted to build the building inside out, which he, he really did. It's a real nice, uh, the, it's located at 500 Kendall Street in Cambridge, Mass. And as he said in the movie there, it is built beside a power plant literally 20 feet away from it. They store over, uh, they store the fuel there, a couple of big tanks over there, right on the Charles River. The site was a brown site. If um, a brown site was a site that was contaminated, 
And what it was, they used to store all the coal there during the uh, early 1900s for the power plant. And all the oil from the coal actually seeped into the ground. So we had to uh, remediate the ground. By doing that, we took over 100,000 cubic yards of gravel out, backfilled it with concrete, capped it. And on top of that, we have a, um, a vapor system. It's a series of tubes on the first floor. There's no basement. It's under the first floor slab. A series of tubes that go under the floor. Once the vapors uh, build up, they'll go up to the 14th floor, go through a series of carbon beds, and out to the Cambridge air. And that's monitored weekly. Every, anybody in that site has to have that type of uh, setup. It's, it's Brownfield. We received the Platinum Award. In 2005, I was at the Banner Building down the street that just got theirs in 2006. We we're a little different than that building. They built it for the, uh, they got theirs for the core. We got ours for almost the, the whole building, which was a, you know, a lot more points. They had, I think they got 62. We ended up getting almost 69. This whole area itself, where it was uh, picked out was really a real tough area in the early uh, 60s and 70s. And as times come on, the Kendall Square started building up. And if I showed you recent pictures, it looks a lot different than it was in this, from this movie itself. The energy use, the building is designed with no boilers at all. We have no boilers in the building at all. We buy the, they call it wasted steam from the plant next door. They generate electricity. From electricity, steam is made. They make 500,000 pounds of steam a day. They can only sell 250,000 pounds. The other 250,000 pounds, a million gallons of water is sucked in from the Charles River and dumped out. The steam itself we bring in is 200 pounds at 450 degrees. We run on our stu two steam absorption chillers up on the 14th floor. Send the steam up there. From there, it goes to the bromine. We make our cooling from the condensate return. And some of the break it down to 50 pound steam. We have steam heat exchanges where we have the hot water and heating for the uh, winter. So a little story about that is the first summer we were built, and this goes to the architects and the designs, designers, they built the building with two chillers, two 450 ton chillers. Well, the first summer we were there is a 90 degree day high humidity, and one of the chillers broke down. The steam condensate return heat exchanger let go. So we shut one chiller down. I thought we were going to be in trouble. That day, we only used 37% on the energy valve. So we had a whole extra chiller. Now, to make the story a little bit further, through the designers and the engineering, when they designed it, they designed it for a steam meter that was much bigger. Down again, down on the first floor, one day we had to shut the steam off. We're working on a PRV valve. As I walked by the steam meter, we were still reading 5,000 pounds. To make a long story short, we got almost $460,000 back from the utility company. They were overcharging us. So it's, you got to be more focused on it. I don't blame the designers or the engineers, but they all thought it was a glass building, and the glass building would take a lot to cool and a lot to heat, but it didn't, uh, they went way beyond what they thought. We have a rainwater collection tank with the water on the uh, top floor. We collect the rainwater off the skylights. We collect it into a thousand gallon tank. This year we come up with an idea with the, we have two 22,000 CFM air handlers. And during the summer, there's a lot of condensation that we're just letting go down the drain. We put pumps under there. We collect that water. We dump it into the rain tank. From there, we dump it into our towers. It's about 1,000 gallons a month, but it's, it cuts a little bit back. A little innovation point. We also have the low um, flow fixtures, the waterless journals. I don't know if we ever dealt with waterless journals. Don't get the fiberglass ones. For the first, uh, they told us for the first six years that it would absorb the smell based on how many people use it. It didn't work out that well. We went to the China one, and the China seems to be working a lot better. We have 38 of them in the building. 
and they're working fine. The only problem we found with them, every six months we have to take them off the wall and there's a four inch drain pipe there and the salts from the urine actually close the hole up. We have to have a plumber go in and clean them all. If you read the manual on the waterless urinals, you're supposed to flush a gallon of water down a night. And if you leave it to the cleaners, I mean, you know, trying to tell them to do it. It's just a little point of interest. The, by doing the waterless urinals, though, they, we save almost 525,000 gallons of water per year. You figure it out, there's, um, they're based on how many times you would actually flush a toilet and they based on 100 times, so there's 12 floors times two. Do the math that comes out to that. The water feature down on the first floor, it holds 1,800 gallons. A little story behind that, the first year we were in, we had an issue with um, humidity, not enough humidity in the building. Well, again, valued engineered out was humidification in the building in the air handlers. So we decided to heat up the water, which we did, up to only about 98 degrees. I got screamed at because we were using energy to heat the water up to give you humidity in the building. But it, it solved the problem, and a lot of people don't know about it, but it's working well. Most of the recycled contents, 93%. When they were building the building, we have a lot of white oak and a lot of um, wood in the building. There's white oak on the floor throughout the building. They use beeswax to, on the floor, which is great except for girls who wear high heels and they lose that little rubber piece on the bottom. We really have, a, uh, we actually have a, a kit that repairs women's shoes. It's easier for us to repair the shoes than it is to sand the floor. <laughs> you, think, you know, and people don't think about these things, but they're really little pit holes. But during the process of building the building, any wood that was brought in that had a finish on it was done outside the building, low VOC. So it really it worked out great. The, most of the material was bought within the 500, yard, 500 mile radius. We have 18 of these um, gardens throughout the building. To me, they're a nightmare. Everybody thinks they're nice. They bought these plants throughout the world. They all require a certain amount of light, a certain amount of humidity, a certain amount of heating. The, what they were, when they were first designed, they were designed to have three blocks high, but due to the weight of them, they went down to two blocks. Now all the plants have the dirt piled up on them. With the dirt piled up on them, now it's squishing all the irrigation pipes. So now we have to dig them all out. Even though we monitor that and meter that, it's uh, interesting. We have a couple of girls come in during the uh, week, once a week. They come in and they'll trim all the trees, cut all the plants, and they, outside a normal tree would have wind blowing the dead leaves off in a building. It doesn't work, so you'll see them out there shaking the trees, leaves falling everywhere. The environmental side of it, which is um, HVAC side. The building is, um, we have 605, no, I'm sorry, 560 fan coils, four pipe system heating and cooling throughout the building. We run them during occupied time. There are three speeds on them. We run them at low speed all the time. As an architect said, he'd come in, he said the air in the building was delicious, which is, you know, the air is always moving. The air handler supplies the 20% of the required fresh air to each unit. The building itself is, um, you gotta follow me on this now, during the off cycles between the hours of 10 p.m., 4 a.m., the temperature outside equals the temperature inside, the wind speed is less than 15 miles an hour, we have these Boston windows would actually open up on the side and the building will flush out. Shuts down the HVAC system. It um, works pretty well. We did it 14 times last year in New England weather. But it, uh, when you come in in the morning, it does smell a little fresh. The stale air doesn't get there. With the fan coils themselves, a person in one office can have the heat running, and the one right beside them can have the air conditioning. We all have what they call smart sensors. A little different from the building down the street. The building down the street, they control all their uh, lighting by going on a, a web page. We do it through a BMS system. And we all the smart sensors, you can override the lights, 
do your, your uh, heating and cooling. And then it only lasts for uh, about an hour, and then we turn it all back. We have an issue with that. We ended up 10 o'clock every night, someone, you know, all the people going to 65 degrees, somebody going to 78 degrees. So at 10 o'clock at night, we reset the whole system back to, at one point it was 73 degrees, now it's 74 degrees. The building was designed for 68 degrees during the winter and 76 degrees during the summer. Yeah, you sit in my office and get the phone calls that come in. <laughs> so after going back and forth and fooling around with the temperature controls, we found out that 74 degree year round is happy with everybody. Less complaints, I mean, I was, one woman was so cold, I told her to put a sweater on. Next thing you know, I got a call from HR, so. <laughs> the, again, the outside views, no matter where you sit in Genzyme Center, you have a view of the outside. The um, daylight is always daylight in the building. It's, it's really, uh, okay. And you can see in this picture here, where we'll, we'll start talking about the heliostats. Off to your right there is the heliostats. They have a program that's programmed from Germany, which follows the sun. They follow the sun over the 63 stationary mirrors, come down onto 1,030 prisms, down to 768 chandeliers. During the, um, when we first started the building, it was, uh, we opened up in October, and we had sun, but during the day, all of a sudden, it's, it was still cloudy in the building. I mean, there was no sunlight coming in. So I kept calling my buddies the German, and they said, no, everything's okay. Well, a couple days later, they called me back laughing. In Germany, they put the month first, no, the day first, and the month. They had it backwards. So once we straightened that out, we were all set. It worked pretty well. The, um, the glass uh, exterior, some of the building, it's, uh, the building was designed to have that double facade as you saw in the film there, to have a double layer of glass, single layer of glass, and about a two foot span all the way around the building on each floor. Well, the fire department came in and said, you can't do that, you have to have fire stops every so many feet. So we said, all right, fine, if that's the case, then we'll only do 38% of the building. Now that little, we call it the Lozier, has a set of blinds out there and has a, a little door on the bottom which Valley and Engineered out was supposed to be mechanically. We have a mechanical window upstairs uh, right above it in the Lozier. And as the temperature reaches above 76 degrees, the window will open up and we open up the bottom flap and the air flows through. During the winter, it never gets above, uh, below four, 45 degrees, 50 degrees, depending on the, uh, the wind, which side of the building you're on. On that same note, each office that has a door to the lozier, if you open the door, it automatically freezes your HVAC system and freezes your lights at that point. We didn't learn about that till like about uh, 30 days. Lou, I, I, on the, the double skip the side, do they have the, the double layer of glass, the double on the glass exterior. on the exterior side, and the, and the, and the singles on the inside. And singles on the inside. That door handle, if it's not pushed up and doesn't lock the pin in, doesn't make the magnet, your air conditioning will not, or heating will not work, and your light will stay at that, that point. We found that out 30 days later. It's, uh, they had put it in the program, but again, overlooked it. I did all the commissioning in the building. I don't know why I missed it, but I, I did. I mean, it's one of those things. I'll take the fault on that one. The, uh, The building, we'll talk about the blinds. We have those um, Warama blinds. They almost look like a stainless steel blind, but it's not, it's painted. They're, uh, they're shaped like a U-shape. They're designed, they have their own weather station, and they have their own sun sensor. And based on what side of the building you're on, the blinds will actually move. The blinds are used for cooling and heating. Anything above 59 degrees will reflect the sunlight out. Anything below 57.4, they'll start to send the light in and give you more heat. When they designed the building, they never thought that they would work that good, and they do. They, they really, uh, they made a big difference in the cooling and the heating. The 
just, is that something you guys tweaked or is that just something they used out of the box? That's a program they had from um, Germany had put that in. Is that on the blinds? Yeah. Yes, they put that in because over in Germany they have the same type of setup and they use those same uh, temperatures. We're thinking of changing them a little bit, but we have to get into their program and it's top secret. I don't know if you've ever dealt with them. We, uh, each blind is 1,011 of them, have their own address. We can control every blind. In fact, Kevin had asked me if I could uh, trend them because everybody has their own control on the blind. They could raise the blind up for one hour. If they raise the blind up, that, you, know, you lose reflection of the light coming in, in the heat, in the cooling. But uh, when I get back, I'm going to see if we can trend that, trend that if it goes up based on the light coming in what the light is, what the light intensity is. That would be an interesting uh, point. The, um, the light coming into the building, we have a, a BMS system that covers 40,000 points. It was Andover, then TAC bought them out, now it's Schneider. We do everything ourselves in-house. The is uh, close to almost uh, 1,700 actuators just on the fan coils and an additional 500 going with the, the cooling towers, the chill water side. So everything is monitored. We we've tweak and, and it's working pretty good. And I was explaining to Kevin, we uh, just put a dead ban in the system itself. And at, when we were doing that at the beginning, we wanted the dead ban, but the controls people said, no, we can't do it. It's too much. We did uh, probably about 30 of them. It took us eight hours just to reprogram them. But it, what a savings it is. I was really surprised. We're having an energy audit done now by Symmetrics. And they came to us. They usually come up to you and they'll say, you know, you got you to do this, do that. It's going to cost you $400,000. They came to us. The most they can save us is $50,000. So from that point, we sat down with them again. And I told them to slice and dice what we're doing. So they're looking at the uh, air handlers, they're looking at the temperature of the fan coils, temperature of the water. We've made a few adjustments to what they're saying. That $50,000 for the dead man? Yeah. No, that 50000 dollars was is that we had a few fan coils that we you can actually disable and let them run in cooling for a while. And for that fifty thousand dollars, he thought we could add something else to make them work. He didn't understand that on our control end of it, we can change that and put it back where it's supposed to be. Let's face it, some places in the building are too hot and too cold, so you have to manually feel it out and override them, put a percentage on the cooling, percentage on, on the heating. And when he did the audit, that's what he found wrong, that you know this is always in heating, this is always in cooling. And we had to tell him, no, no, that's, that's not right. So he backed off on that. One of the thing, big things he said that we could save on is lighting in which we are saying we're doing more of a uh, light study now. We have 76 different light bulbs throughout the building, and it's, uh, everything's on dimmable balances, except for the life safety. And Kevin and I talked about that. I think uh, when I go back, we're going to sit down with the inspector and ask him if we can shut them off, especially during the day. You don't need them. And then we have three stairways, and why are the lights always on in there? Maybe we make an emotion sensor when someone open, you know, opens the door, automatically comes on. That would be a big savings to us. The prisons themselves in the chandelier, when they built the uh, building, they put a track tell up above. And they basically said that um, the chandeliers, clean them on your own. So they have this track tell that goes out 12 stories up. You're hanging over this, almost like the window washer setup. They have a winch on the side. The heaviest chandelier is 250 pounds. So when they hook up, hook up to the winch onto the chandelier and let it go down, the track tell is flipping over like this. So we had to come up with a different type of uh, idea, which we, I come up with two I-beams with a winch connected to the I-beam, which is off the track tail, now it works fine. We do that twice a year. When we, were, uh, when we first started doing it, we thought we were smart. We used kiddie pools, little plastic ones. And guess what happened when they come down? They sliced them. We had water everywhere. 
since then we made a, um, I made this eight foot long, two feet wide, four feet high, with a bunch of little jets in it, a little mini pump, put some uh, cleaning solution in, just drop the chandeliers right into it, wash them up, and send them right up, and they dry right out. The other thing they told us, you had to put them down in order, but I guess they didn't understand the physics. As they come down, for some reason, the, the magnetism or something, or the force, just pushes them all away from each other, and the other one comes right down. It's pretty, uh, it's interesting, uh, and it's a 16-hour project to do that. Life safety, harnesses, safety's involved. We have to close down the whole atrium, every, every door, every, everything. It's nightmare. The light wall, the strips of um, polish on the side, I'm not sure if you can see them. They're along the, uh, right beside the elevators, the glass elevators. They call them a light wall. They were supposed to be done by Walrammer in Germany, but again, value engineered out. They went to a local person who made them out of like a, a blind material, which is much thinner, and we've had a lot of issues with them. It's on its own separate program. Again, that's based on foot candles. The whole building itself is based on foot candles, and everybody knows what a foot candle is, a measurement of light in a square foot. We had a study done by uh, MIT. They came in with all their little light sensors, and they told us a normal building would be 25 foot candles, and they, our building is 45 foot candles. So it's really bright in there. If you have any questions, by all means, there's, uh, there's a lot more that uh, I can talk about that. Uh, also, on the, uh, where the blinds are set up, we have a reflective ceiling panel that are two, two panels out. It's two by two squares, so it's actually four feet out. As the sunlight comes in, it bounces off them and brings it into the atrium. In that, I left a bunch of booklets up there. In that booklet describes everything, everything I'm speaking about, and tells you how that's all done. That, that uh, artwork there is interesting. This is the, when the painters put it in, there's no way you can match it up to that. They didn't put the head in the right place. So as you're looking up, I'm not sure if it comes in the next photo, but if, if you're looking at it, there's, I've tried every combination there is to try to do it, and it doesn't work. Glare issues? Glare. Oh, glare. glare. No. The grand stairway there, believe it or not, the, there's a lot of sunspots in there, and one woman had, two women had tripped down going down the stairway. Since then, we put a, a center rail. Couldn't just be a regular rail, you know us. $140,000 later, and it's supposed to represent the bottom of a boat. It's, a, it's interesting. The, uh, I'm going to open it up to questions now. The, the blinds, when they articulate, you know, for heating and cooling, does that also affect the light level that is passed through? Not really, because the blind itself has two, um, two motors. One for the top that is solid, and the bottom that has, actually you can see through it just like this here. So as they close, you can still see outside. As far as the sunlight comes in, it still lets enough sunlight in, but still pushes heat out, especially in the, in the cooling modes. The yes? Materials were gathered, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. The materials were gathered uh, within a 500 mile radius, except for the landscaping materials inside. You said they were The plants, yes. Plants. Well, there's a few. Well, why, was that, why was that choice made to go far afield? Well, you got to remember now, Genzyme was at the cutting edge of all this green technology. Everything we had to buy that we wanted was not local. And one of the things was, is obviously the blinds. No one in America made that type of blind. The CEO wanted to have plants from around the world. The uh, building itself was uh, the way it was designed. Can you do the... Uh... Yeah. yeah. Thank you. The building was done with um, filigree construction. Does everybody understand what that is? And what that is is a series of uh, 
planks. They're about four feet wide, 40 feet long. They put them on each floor. By doing that, they saved over, uh, what was the number on that? This, they saved over 25,000 square feet of plywood, otherwise they would have used for concrete floors. The, on top of that, they have four inches of styrofoam. On, in the styrofoam, they have a series of lines cut through them. They have tenders going to each column. Then on top of that, they put another four inches of uh, concrete. So the floor is, the building itself, a normal building that size would be about 1,800 tons of steel. It only took 1,300 tons of steel. And it was, because of the light load we put in, the styrofoam we put in between the floors. Okay. What are the filigree panels made of? Concrete, the two and a quarter inches thick. And the Right. Okay. When you say 75% daily, are you including light that's coming from the atrium? Offices that are on the atrium side as opposed to the outside? Yes. Yeah. So you count the light that's coming in from the top and being going out. It's in. all reflected around. As you can see how it's all, most of the offices are, um, there's no corner offices to the CEO would like it that way. So a lot of the offices are on the exterior of the wall. Most of the interior near the atrium are all uh, cubicles. So they have a lot of sunlight and they're not that high. They're only five feet high. These are the blinds we were talking about. The German product? German product, Warama. Warama, W-R-E-M-A. Okay. I know the actual void of the atrium is really kind of irregularly shaped. It's not just one clean volume with like, you know, up and down edges. Does that start to affect the way that the building gets programmed in terms of um, how much natural light is allowed to get beneath some of those floor plates that jut out, or was that kind of taken into consideration with how much daylight can penetrate each floor? It was taken into consideration, and I'm sure, like Kevin does, they made models. I have a model in my office almost this size, and they used that and seeing the sunlight coming in through the atrium. Another uh, key note about the, the atrium itself is the fire system we have in the building is... Uh, an elaborate fire system, all computerized. We have 68 what I call garage doors, 12 feet long, 10 feet high. If a fire goes off in the atrium, all these doors will close down. And then we have four 33,000 CFM exhaust fans. At the same time that happens, all the blinds go up, the prisms go straight up and down, and the doors down the first floor open up to let the air in. A little story about that, naturally, it was a uh, December 29th, one o'clock in the morning, zero degree temperature. We have security guards who love to put microwave popcorn into the oven. <laughs> sure enough, they're in the sock, they're on the third floor, which is different from the fire system. It's a pre-action system. They set it off. They called me because the fire department couldn't find the button to reset it. I said, no, it's not at the fire panel. It's upstairs on the third floor. So by the time I get in, it was about 2.30. It was cold in the building. Walked in, reset the whole thing. I came in the next morning at 8 o'clock. Right down on the first floor, all the plants all froze and died. $35,000 later. As in Genzyme, he probably got a promotion and he's probably a, a director by now. <laughs> in some of the atrium photos, when it looked like it was well daylit, it looked like there were ceiling lights on. And so I was wondering if you are you had to balance the light. There's a bright spot, and so you had to balance. If you can see where those trees are there, see them up there? You're talking about the sunflowers right there. Well, no, they were also just uh, you know, circular. That would be the light safety lights. Okay. Based on the uh, foot candles, we have uh, five different milieus. It goes from uh, 5,000 all the way down to night mode, starting one, two, three, four, and five. And if it's up that high, most of the lights go right off except for the life safety ones, which is probably more than a third of the building. It's a, it's a Boston, no, Boston law, but I want to try to attack it when we get back home. The, uh, but those sunflowers we had seen, uh, the way he designed them was that instead of having the light come right down on you, he put the lights on the columns, reflected up to what the little sunflowers, and he more or less just spread it out, and it's sort of like a, a softer feeling, as he would say. Genzyme has a coffee station on each floor. We had uh, a few years ago, the coffee 
price was $1.5 million. We went back to a different type of coffee. Now we're down to about 800000 Try taking coffee away from the CEO. It doesn't work. Don't forget now, there's like a 30 different coffees and there's at least 20 different teas. And we have a full kitchen up on the 12th floor that seats 125 people. So it uh, opens up at 6.30 in the morning, closes at 3. What kind of experiments in blending technology did you experiment with? What they did? Yes. Well, they brought in... Um, Barton Bach, yes. So he was... He was Bar the, yeah, Bartenbach is uh, out of Austria, I believe. Austria, correct. Vienna. Uh, and they have a, well, Lou has been there. I'll let Lou talk about it. I've just seen it online. It's quite a, uh, quite a place. It, uh, we went over there and we were looking at it, and he has like about the size of a football field, a big, huge dome. And it almost looks like uh, all stars up there. And he, he can actually make the sunlight onto a building model that he puts every different direction. When we were there, we was in the process now of lighting up a, a whole town. A town was built on the side of a mountain with no sunlight. He was going to put heliostats up there to reflect the sunlight down on top of the, uh, the city. I don't know if he ever did it. It'd be uh, interesting to find out. Martin Bach. Martin Bach. He's in the uh, booklet back there. Construction cost of the building cost $141 million. 107 was the construction, and the rest was tenant fit out. They told us back then if we had built without the green technology, we could have built a 22-story building. And how many stories is it? It's uh, 13, 12, and then 13 and 14 of the penthouses. And how many square feet? 352,000 square feet. 70,000 is the atrium. That's it. That's is including the atrium. Including the atrium, right. It's 250,000 uh, square feet of uh, office space. I see Doug working on the math there. Tell us, what, tell us the answer. <laughs> I might have missed this already, but were you working for Genzyme before this building, or were you hired specifically to run this building? Or what, where were you in the process, too, as far as I like, was, the um, I was process? hired. Um, five years before we started the building, and I worked in an R&D lab in Kendall Square, which is probably about a mile away. We had seven buildings down there, and I did all the uh, HVAC engineering down there. Then from there, they asked me if I would help out in this building doing the commissioning. They, we, had, we had already contracted a commissioning company, but according to the leads, it'd be nice if in-house people did it too. So I was there from the second floor up, so I know every little corner of the building. There's a few of us are the same way. But yeah, they, uh, they recruited me. Painted myself into a corner now, so I really can't go anywhere. <laughs> Sounds like there are challenges every day, though. There is, you know, and I always say it. I have a crew of about eight men, and in order to run a smart building, you need smart people. It's not like if the air conditioning breaks down on the 10th floor, go look at it. You don't do that first. You go right to the computer, the BMS system, look it up. It'll tell you what the problem is. The actuator is working or the actuator isn't working, too hot, too cold, or the person has the door open or the window open, the contact's not made. So it's a simple fix there. If you can talk a little bit about the uh user or occupant comfort level and, and productivity if it's increased since the workers have moved into the center? The um, building itself is, they did a survey on it and we have less than 0.1 sick day per month there. So people really like to come to work. They have the controls with the smart sensor, they can control their own lighting and heating during occupied mode, control their own windows. The, what we do is probably every six months we do a move out We'll take a department, move them out to another building, bring those people, and put them back in this building just to get the taste of it. But once they get in, they don't want to get out. They really don't. It's, uh, the, you've seen a lot of the gardens in the air, open areas. They, they sort of push you. If you're getting all stressed out, go out there and sit out there and you know, have a meeting with your uh, upper management. Luke, might you discuss some of the, maybe some 
items that were dis were discovered through the commissioning process that might have gone wrong that you that maybe you guys caught during the construction or during the design phase? Well, with all the fan coils, there was uh, all the fan coils with the cooling. They had the condensate lines going across, and there's like close to 42 fan coils on each floor. Some give or take a few, but if we didn't commission those condensate lines, we would have had water all over the ceilings. That was one of the uh, bigger ones. Another factor with this building here is they never thought of our lovely design engineers is that we are solely dependent on steam. And twice a year, the steam plant decides to do the maintenance. So you know what they say to us? We have to go out and rent the boiler, $17,000, just to hook up. We've made adapters on the side of the steam pipes. We've taken, uh, we have a fuel tank for our 750 kV generator. We pump the oil out of that, put that into the uh, oil-fired boiler that we put in the side of an alley. But since then, we get a little bit smarter. Um, in fact, when I get back, I'll probably sign a, pick out a contract. We're putting two electric multi-stack chillers. I don't know if you ever heard of them. Oilless compressors, really nice. And our company back there, NSTAR, is going to give us a rebate if we install them and we'll become energy uh, star rated, which will be a, a good point for us. That's one of the drawbacks that, about that building. But isn't it ultimately less expensive to not have those boilers and, and use the waste steam throughout the year and then rent the boiler for that period for that cost? Aren't you saving more money than you're paying to do that? Not really. What happens is, again, remember I explained that the chiller was too, the chillers themselves were too big for the building. We go into night mode. The most we use that on a high, real hot day is maybe 400 tons of chill. But during the night, we drop down to 60 tons. If you understand about chillers, how they go through the dilution cycle, it ran 1,300 hours last year and it started up 1,200 times and the cost of that steam is killing us. So now we'll put these electric chillers in, we'll make that stage four on the, on the uh, sequence. Stage one will be chiller one, stage two will be chiller two. The free cooling heat exchanger will be three, and this will be number four. And we'll have our little uh, software in there to decide which one should run. And then in spring and fall, if we really don't need the chiller to run, we can run electric chillers. And tell you the truth, the electric chiller is cheaper than the steam chiller to run. But again, you know, they went for that. We don't have boilers in the building. This is my, this is my own personal, uh, what I see. Well, so what you've seen by the way it's actually running, are you seeing energy savings that were modeled? Are you actually seeing the energy savings or are you not doing as well? because of that issue? Well, if you took what they designed the building for and what we did now, we have cut it right in half. The watts per square foot was designed 2.0, we have it down to 1.2. Oh, we're doing much, much better. I mean, and again, it's all because it's not that the, the building is doing great, but the way they designed it, the engineers and the designers, they over-designed it, and that's good in our behalf, because now we're, you know, we're looking at a great running building, which it, it's, uh, it's running really, uh, really well. And some metrics actually proved it with us. A few little issues with the light things, but we'll, uh, we'll straighten that out. The, um, another factor is we have uh, six uh, heat exchangers. And for some reason, we're having an issue with that. And we're not sure what it is. Maybe the steam's just not. Uh, we have a tube with the steam on the exterior of the water, which I thought would have been the other way around. But it's, uh, we're having little issues with that, but that's part of the game of having a, a building. Part of the condensate return steam we use, we heat up the hot water for the showers and for the kitchen. We have electric backup hot water heater, which really doesn't come on that much. We have uh, two 400-ton um, chillers, I mean 400-ton towers. They have two uh, fans on them. We're able to program them. The water coming in, on, depending on the ambient temperature outside, the water will come through the bottom of the tower only. As it gets a little bit uh, warmer, it starts to go up through the top. And as it gets a little bit warmer, fan one will come on, then fan two will come on. And that's really worked out well. 
the first year we were there again, he came in one night because what happens is that if the steam goes down or the chillers go down, the data center automatically heats right up. All the heats right up. So right away, as soon as you hear that, you know either the steam's down or there's a problem. Well, I went in that night and went up to the tower, and the whole tower was a block of ice. The electric heaters did not come on. And we were only in the building, you know, less than six months. So what we did is that after, you know, I was using my head, I took the water from the steam and, you know, melted it. But now that made the water hotter, so, you know, the alarms went off. But what we did now, anything below 20 degrees, we reversed the fans that come down and blow the air out so it doesn't ice up on the sides. That's only a protective item, so in case the heaters don't work again. What kind of problems did you have with the previous water system for flushing? The gray water? Yes. Well, Massachusetts, again, we weren't allowed to use gray water for any flushing, anything. The only thing we could use the gray water for was for the putting it back into the tower. They were not, we wanted to put it in the planters. We wanted to put it into the, uh, the toilets, and they wouldn't let us. Now they've, they've, some of the buildings are starting to get it. Again, that goes back to we have a Coroma toilet more than 500 miles away, Australia. And again, at the time, they were the only ones with the one button and the two button. So we bought them, and we have a few issues with them. But now Coroma's around the area. Little things like that. that uh, all the uh, CEO's furniture that all came from uh, Germany. And on his desk cracked, and you know, what do you do? You can't get another one, you have to wait for them. It's all, uh, like I say, it was all cutting edge, and it was, now it's great. We just did a project down in New Jersey, and a friend of mine is a project manager down there, and I asked him, could you compare the prices if you were gonna go, we're gonna go get a LEED certification, but tell me what the extra cost would be. And after the project was done, did the whole project, and he said to me that, you know, there was no extra cost. Everything we bought was right off the shelf. The only big cost was the cost for the uh, LEED certification. That was a big uh, chunk of money. Not, nothing against LEED, but I think I'm not the only person saying that, too. Was Massachusetts going to change the law? The for the gray water? Yes. Yeah, yeah, they have a little bit. Okay. We had big issues with the waterless urinals. They wouldn't let us put them in. Okay. The plumbing inspector. Finally, we got that passed. Do you know what the cost was for the certification? What the cost was? Yeah. What, for Genzyme Center? Mm -hmm. And close to almost, I think it was close to 110000 This was at... That's for the certification cost to USGBC and paying somebody to do the certification. Right, yeah. The one down in New Jersey cost 76000 and this was how many years later? And now they've changed it now. It used to be up to 69 points. Now it's 100 points now in order to get a platinum. There's a lot little different uh, criterias they meet with that. We were thinking about going with what they call the EBOM, existing building operations. And we were told by upstairs, if you don't get platinum, don't go for it. <laughs> so it's, we're in the stages right now of trying to figure it out. Structure. What kind of glass? It's that low E double uh, facade. The whole building is all glass. I can get you the name of it. it. Believe it or not, it came from Canada. And that was an interesting point because all these facades you're seeing put up now, it's all glass. They're great, but they're not weather tight. You have a building and it's in a little bit of negative, you'll have water coming in. And when we first moved in, we had a few issues with the, um, the water coming in, literally coming in the windows. We took the building from negative, put it to a positive to push the water out. We've had them come back and reseal them. You mean the glass as well as the glazing system? Yes. Came from Canada. Yeah. The framework. And framework. The way, it was, the way the building's designed, the frame is only attached to the building, is not used to support the building. You with the pressure drive from the, in the atrium from the top to the bottom, the higher pressure at the top, and there was we we tweaked that a lot. I mean, we were able to uh, some of the fan coils we had to put a little bit high speed. We have the two of the uh, the air handlers that have a heat recovery wheel on them. 
we have a VFD drive on that, then we can either base that on the amount of the pressure based on the way the building is. We have 11 CO2 sensors throughout the building. They're all in the conference rooms. Anything about 1,000 ppm, the fan will automatically come on, pump more air into it. We also, also have a green roof. And the roof, as I was telling Kevin earlier, they put the roof down with Sonofil. Great job. They tested it for a week. Our roof is designed with the, um, on top of the rubber roof, there's a membrane, cloth membrane. Then on top of that, it's four inches of styrofoam. On top of that, another membrane. Another, on top of that, certain areas, there's uh, paving blocks. There's uh, close to 6,000 square feet of vegetation up there. Well, the gentlemen who were coming in came in with the razor blades, and they were cutting them on the roof. And that was one of the things that we found out is uh, after being in the building three years, where is all the water coming from? We ended up taking up off the roof havers, and we found 85 leaks. Uh, we're on the last one right now. The biggest one was above Henry's office, the CEO. <laughs> came in and wow. Did you use different kinds of glass on the different facades of the building? No, the same, same all the way, same, same all the way around. Do you think uh, you would do it differently next time, use something different? I think design? I would do it differently, and one of the things I would probably do is I would probably come up two feet instead of the glass going all the way down. For some reason, it's a better um, insulator. This is just my own personal. Uh, you mean no glass floor? Right. Okay. Up from two feet up, it'd be fine. <coughs> glass all the way up, but not going down. Kevin had shown me a picture earlier, and I, I thought that was a great idea. Too much glare? Yeah, especially down on the bottom. There's a lot of, uh, we have a few issues with that, but. What kind of issues? I thought maybe glare or something else? Well, it's a lot of water builds up in that, and the way it's connected to the building okay. is a lot of air coming up. Well, lovely smokers throughout the uh, building end up walking outside and throw a cigarette into the um, the the chip wood chips there, and they walk away. Next thing you know, it catches on fire close to the building. That comes up the facade and goes through every floor because it gets behind it. So it's. Uh, and we've taken them apart. It's like a little metal panel on it. We've tried insulating and seal it, but you, you just can't do it all. It's just too much. That was one of the, uh, the faults there. That's part of that glazing system. Okay. Right. What was the name of the company? Begins with a V. Begins with a V. Viracon. What's that? Viracon? Viracon, that's the air handler, isn't it? Oh, sorry. No, that's glazing. Glaze. It's glass. May have been them. Not sure, but I, I think it's in the book too. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they they came right out. And they they told us. They make glass, but not glazing systems. So Lou, you had mentioned uh, the night flush and how you used it. What fourteen days yes, last I, year? Yes, uh, I explained it to them how we shut the uh, the building actually goes down into a, between the hours of ten and four a.m. We. Uh, we did it 14 times last year, which the air is nice and it is pretty neat, but it's um, one of the big things about that is, is the, some of the dust in the building. Mm. We've tried to straighten it out, but the other thing with the plant is, again, the learning curve. Every three months, we have to infest the planters with bugs, ladybugs, little cockroaches, little... And the first time we did it, naturally, we had the lights on, and guess where all the bugs went? So we just did it last week, and uh, it worked pretty well. And the way they keep all the bugs in the plant is they put soap detergent all the way around the edge, and they stay inside. And within two or three weeks, they end up dying and germinating into the, uh, the soil itself. The wood chips themselves are fiery tartan. They're almost like a plastic. I've even tried to take a torch to it and try to catch it on fire. And it's pretty good. Really expensive, though. No, no, it's a really, uh, plastic. it's like a, it's a plastic base, but it's a fiery tartan for interior building. Recycle content? Probably. Rubber tires, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> do, uh, do you have any idea if this building has changed design practices in the area? From when it was built? Yeah, you know, it just, you know, 
instruct the architects in the area to start doing better design and you know more sustainable design? I think just a little bit, not much. As far as the the blinds, the glass, the heliostats, the way the building is set up, all glass around it, that's fine. I think the mechanical ends, they definitely made some changes. One of the things is we're 33,000 CFM short on makeup air into the building because they took it out of the first floor. And by doing that, that means most, some of the time the building's in negative air, so we have to ramp up the motors to make it positive. You know, that was a design that they thought, you know, varied engineered out. And now in order to put a, an air handler down on the first floor, we just don't have the room. It's another thing about this building, there was no, um, there's no storage anywhere. We have uh, 12 rooms, 500 square feet, a little bit more of, for uh, recycling, but that's it. There is no other closet space, there is nothing else. And that lozier they were talking about, Banish there, the architect said if he built this building again, he would not put that double facade. So that's a wasted space. No one's using it. It's two feet wide by about 50 feet long. You're, you know, it's, you're wasted. We're still paying rent for it, but you're still paying for that square footage, even though nobody's out there. That's one of the things he said. Uh, could you, could you uh, give us an update on Stefan Banish's Science Center across from WGBH in Holston? Turner was capping that off in October when I was there. Yes, that's uh, just about in the final stage now. In fact, I'll be going there next week and I'll be showing them how to do the blinds, how to hook them up, and how to write the software. So they resumed construction from where they were. They, they, were, they, were, they had to shut it down for a while. Which one is this now? Uh, uh, south of the Harvard Business School. Oh no, that's all still shut down. Still shut down. Huh? We have uh, the Alston plant we have over there. We just built a, a cogen plant. Harvard came to us about a few years ago. We're going to shut your steam off. So we said, all right, we'll build our own cogen plant. Now we're almost about done. They'll come up, oh, we're not going to do that now. <laughs> now it's too late. So, it's so what's Turner going to do in the meantime? Just wait for the go sign? Believe it or not, when all those buildings were going to be built, a lot of contractors signed on with them instead of signing on with other companies to do other projects. And when they stopped building, they lost a lot of work. They actually, a lot of companies uh, slowed right down almost one or two employees. Turn is still doing a couple of jobs, but not very big. Just, it's, they're pretty good. With the donut shaped floor plan and windows inside and out, are there exit corridors or just stair towers in certain locations? How do you do your exiting? We have three stairways, one, two, and three, and they're on the north side, west side, and south side. And as a new employee, you're supposed to read the handbook and it'll explain to you in case of a fire mode. Again, if there's a fire smoke alarm in the high-rise building, you know the floor above and the floor below will close down, but the rest of the building will not evacuate. But if you have something in the atrium, it'll evacuate the whole building. But you know, that alarm goes off on the eighth floor, the ninth and seventh floor are supposed to shut down. Well, you hear the girl talking, and the people on the second floor say, I'm leaving, I'm not, I'm not staying. And most of the people leave the building. Every false alarm, I was told by the CEO, cost us $92,000 a minute. All the salaries of everybody going out the door. <laughs> the, um, we have a loading dock. We have a grease pit that we have. Uh, we collect all the, any excess oil, which works pretty, uh, pretty good. We have that checked twice a year. Install the basement because of the brownfield condition? Correct. They have, if you look at the pictures there, there's something like about, a, I think it's 110 pilings. At the time, back in the 1800s, that was all water filled. And they, when they cut down Beacon Hill, they backfilled it all in Kendall Square. So it's actually all marsh underneath. So that's one of the reasons why. If you're ever in the Boston area, look me up. I'll give you a tour. I'll show you all the mechanicals. You know, we're a biotech company. We, have, uh, we do everything in redundancy. We have two extra pumps to do one thing. But we all, we stage them all. We trend everything. We trend the lighting. We trend the uh, heating, cooling. Uh, my next venture is on the top of the building up there, on the left-hand corner, is we have what they call a 
looks like a um, set of stage and structure. They call it wind sails. But it's starting to fall apart. We went to have it priced to be repainted, almost $400,000. So I said, hey, let's get together. We started talking. And now we hired this company, Choir Revolutions, and it's an upside down egg beater. We're going to put windmills in to generate about, yeah, that's the structure there. Yeah, lovely, isn't it? We're going to put four windmills up there. I have to go in front of the CEO next week, see if we can get the funding for it. That'll be about the only change that would, uh, would happen. To build the building, though, it cost about, it was 16.4% 16, 16 more than a normal building. I have all the, what we paid for every single part of the green upgrade. So it was, it was a little expensive, but it was, we never thought we'd get this recognition. And again, when he was building it, he didn't say that we were going to go for a LEED certification. They came to us. We do over close to 4,000 tours a year. Book solid. Book solid. Several a day. Oh, easy. Easy. <laughs> Sometimes even more. Especially when all the conventions are in town, everybody wants to come and see the building. You got to understand, everybody is still working there, but we sort of, we work around it. And part of a green point is doing a tour. So we sent Lou over to the Banner Bank building today. He said, hey, it's a lead platinum building. They, they signed on for this. Yeah. <laughs> so he got a nice tour from Marva today. Yeah, but that's a, it's a nice building over there. It's interesting how they did the raised floor and the, uh, Genzyme wanted to, at the beginning, do a raised floor and use a thermal mass, leaving the ceilings exposed, the columns all exposed. But after safety, lighting, and all the fire things, they said no. So we ended up scratching out the raised floor and put the ceilings in. And again, they didn't lower it that much, so the fan coils are 23 inches from the ceiling down. The ceiling is 25 inches, so there's very little and we used that half-inch grid with that soft insulation tile. That, uh, if you're you know, doing the paint of that mural there, one of these days maybe we should change it. But it works well, though. The building, the building runs great. But if we weren't there to maintain it, it uh, I don't know what would happen. On the video, I saw some shimmering light on the wall, looking like light was reflecting off of a pool of water. On the, uh, the light wall itself? Uh, I don't recall where it was, but there was looked like uh, light reflecting off of water, shimmer, shimmering on one of the walls. The uh, reflecting pond, it's uh, made of uh, 23 inches thick, and it's stainless steel, welded stainless steel plates. And the water, if you're standing up on the 12th floor looking down, it is a reflecting pond. The MIT students uh, had to get a pitcher inside water. So guess what they did? They came into the building, they stood inside there, and they took a pitcher. And they told me, you know, that doesn't support that much weight. It's 1,800 gallons. Bill, I think you are talking about, I think he is talking about the light wall. So it's... It's oh, the a, light walls up on the right there? Sort of mirrored panels that run vertically in the space, right? Yes, those are the ones that I um, have a few problems with. I might have uh, missed this, but did you mention what the energy use index was for the building or how much more efficient it is over you know, similar types? Or the, code? One of the problems is that we couldn't benchmark this against any building. When I went over to the, this building here, Vienna, I was hoping I could benchmark against that, but it, it's not the same. They don't use the same type of light reflection, especially with the blinds. They use a control light and that on and off, on, you know, based on the sunlight, it'll dim the lights. We've, uh, we've tried, we've even tried taking two of our floors and benchmarking it against one of our other buildings. M uh, was it MIT did a study on the building and they put it into a program, took all our energy efficient, you know, numbers, put them into this program, did it, and they came to me and said, our building is way out of whack. We are not energy efficient at all. So I said, let me see the program. And looking at the program, when it came down to the boilers, it doesn't have it in the program saying that there was no boilers in the building. 
It thought, it said it, we get it from the steam plant. So they took that steam plant and put it in our building. So you can imagine what the energy cost would be. When I get back, we'll see if they had straightened that out. But they, I figured they would have picked it up, but they didn't. Any other questions? We have all the um, lead certification. We have a bike room that has close to 90 bikes. We have showers down there. We're all within a half mile of banks. Um, MBTA is right there. The train station is right there. Gym is right across the street. We have a, an open area, which is on the north side of it. During the winter, they use that for a skating rink. During the summer, they use it for concerts. We have farmer's markets on Thursday during the day. It's a, it's a nice place to work. Everybody's happy. Everybody walks around with a smile. Not lately, but... Is that that two-foot space you were referring to earlier? Yes, the loja. Can you, can you slide back? That's a, um, that's a weather station for the um, BMS. Does the wind, temperature. That's not at our place. <laughs> this is the best I'll be able to do. So is that, is that actually a that's what they call the loja. You can see that area that's open there with the blinds. The so door's going into the office. Correct. It was supposed to it move the air the all the way. Space. Yeah, it was supposed to move the air around the building. But with the fire department saying to us, we have to close it off. And they said, well, forget it, then we won't do it. So what is it used for now? Can you use this to walk around the building? No. You see the glass down the end? It stops right there. I think it stops every 60 feet. And so we just did one side of the building instead of going all the way around. It was. Um, and it, that's what's all day long. It's like that. It's been like that for six years. No one, you know, you're allowed to go out there, but they, no one goes out there. Okay. So the original design was to use the circulation. Move the air, right. That was the original design, but it. You mean people in there or just air? What's that? Circulation for both people in the air? I think so, yeah. 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 Almost that thermal. Uh, okay. A lot of things. You know, I had the chance to go visit Lou and I wanted to include the Genzyme building in a, in a little research study on daylight patterns and I had the chance to show Lou those today but uh, you know he walked me around for it must have been a couple hours it was a fantastic tour and the piece that I really appreciated was just all these little details these little stories about how to make these things work right and uh, it's a perspective that I hadn't had the chance to see very often so I was hoping that that he could share it with all of us and and I and I think it's really you know Designing high-performance buildings is one thing, and operating them is, is a whole nother, and you know, the stories, I think, are really rich. And it's yeah. great for the architects and the designers. After you build a building and after you do this, you know, you give it to them. Don't just walk away. Go back after a year or so. We've tried to get them back, say, wait a second, can you help us design this? And, hey, we've already got our money. See you later. <laughs> but a lot, of, a lot of them are pretty good. They all like the, um, you know, the fact that you say Genzyme, no, They'll come and talk to you. But most of them are pretty good, but it's, you know, a lot of things, you know, a lot of the, some of the pumps now that we're, we're changing out, they don't make anymore. So why, why'd you get that pump? Because now we have to go to a different type model pump. Little things like that are just irritating. The actuators, the actuator they put up on the towers, instead of putting an outdoor actuator, they put one that would be an inside a mechanical space. So we go up there after four years and it's rotten from the inside out. They're supposed to have heaters in it. We didn't know that. You know, you, you could have told me that. But little things like that to make a building go. Mm -hmm. So if you do design a building or if you do build a building, you know, take pride in what you do. I do a lot of tours at Genzyme for the engineers, mechanical engineers, architects, and I, I say that to them. You know, stand behind what you build. Well, I appreciate your openness, too, because on, on one hand, I hear all these issues, all these challenges, all these little hurdles that you get through, and you're the one dealing with them. And on the other hand, I, I hear you say you love the building, and I can tell you know, from taking the tour that it's, it's a place of pride for sure. So. Yeah, I was told either the, the flagship sales uh, were in trouble. So it's, <laughs> it's a challenge, but you, know, you, have to, you have to deal with it. Does uh, Stefan Benish uh, come to Cambridge quite a bit, or does he mostly No, no, he comes, he stops by every couple of years. He'll, he'll swing by, yeah. Mostly he's in Stuttgart, right? He's, he's around once in a while. It'll, uh, since then, again, you know, they've 
He's done well in America. The same thing with the Warrior of Blinds. They were the first ones in America. They've done real well. A lot of the, uh, even the Greenscape that designed the uh, landscape in, they're doing real well and they use Genzyme in their uh, little picture there. Well, thank you, Lou, for making the trip out to Boise. Thank you. And uh, thank you, as always, to our sponsors, Idaho Power Company, Northwestern Energy, Avista, and Better Bricks. And please remember to sign in in the back, my students included. Please remember to sign in.